Welcome. I'm Alden Lowry, Senior Editor of Race, Class, and Communities at WBEZ. Thank you for joining me for Generational Legacy, a conversation on the evolution of Black activism. Let me welcome my first guest. Uh, the first is Clarence Page, a journalist with the Chicago Tribune. Clarence, thank you for being here. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Now, let me see if I can help, help you see me now. <laughs> there you go. Better? Okay. All right. I'll, Clarence, it's, I'll it's, it's, say, it's I'm still getting used to the internet age. <laughs> hey, we're, we're, we're all learning, man. We're all learning. If you're under 25, it's a learning process every day. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. You are as pleasant and delightful as you are accomplished. So we, we appreciate right. you joining us today. Thank um, you. Glad to be here. Great, great. We also have a Dr. Lionel Kimball. He's a professor of African-American history at Chicago State University. Dr. Kimball, welcome. Thank you for being with us. Hey, thanks for having me. Great. So we're going to start the conversation off with a, with a question, a personal question we'd like to ask of each of you. Uh, and then this is that question. What is your first memory of encountering the concept of or the need for Black activism? Clarence, uh, why don't we start with you? Uh, in general or in Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's 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 keep it to Chicago. Okay, that, that's fine. I, I, I was just thinking about when I first uh, came to Chicago, fresh out of college, been hired by the Chicago Tribune. I, I was on the South Side on a Saturday morning. The radio came on, and I, uh, I heard Jesse Jackson's voice. Uh, it was 1969, and that was the Saturday morning uh, Operation Breadbasket meeting, which is now Operation mm -hmm. Push. Uh, and I would say that was my first direct exposure to Chicago activism. But uh, before you knew it, I was covering more community organizations than I can name or list. Uh, Chicago, it turned out, I had no idea this when I first moved here, but it's, it's a real mecca of, uh, of uh, community organizations, if you will. Uh, and uh, Saul Alinsky certainly is known uh, for uh, his organization, which trained many uh, organizers, including uh, Barack Obama and various others over the years. Uh, and uh, uh, these grassroots groups, uh, Nancy Jefferson on the west side, a bunch of people on the south side, it was really, um, uh, well, for a journalist, it, it was a, a dream to find all these story opportunities, actually. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, when I was studying the history of Chicago, I, I would say I, I personally uh, would say my, my uh, earliest knowledge of uh, Chicago Black organizing would have been the World, World Columbian Exposition, where Ida B. Wells and Frederick Douglass uh, both um, uh, lobbied heavily for more Black inclusion uh, in that great historic event. So you find some of us everywhere, as my daddy used to say. <laughs> great, great. Well, Clarence, thank, thanks for those memories. Dr. Kimball, how about you? Your first memory of encountering the concept of or the need for Black activism? That's a, that's a really good question. And when I was thinking about it, um, I think like Clarence, there's a, there's a number of stories that pop into my mind. But on a very personal level, I remember in 1983, I was like 19 years old. And my dad, who really wasn't, like Chicago is, is really filled with a community of, of Black community that really are very politically astute, right? But my, my dad wasn't one who, in my lifetime, was very politically active. But as a, as a young man, I think in his, in his, maybe his early 30s, late 20s, I remember he came home one night and he was very excited and talked to my mother about the election of Harold Washington. He, he, uh, he, he volunteered on the campaign and, you know, and I didn't really understand what, what was going on. I grew up in a very activist family a uh, politically astute family. We talked about politics all the time. My grandmother was very, very politically tied in. But my dad came home after the election of Harold Washington and he, and he said, like, we're talking to my mom, he said, he said, you know, it's one of the great things about it, like even the wine heads got sober enough to go to vote for Harold Washington, right? And it, it never dawned on me till I got a little bit older, older, just how important that moment in our history here in the city, but also regionally and nationally, the, the election of Harold Washington was. And then just talking to my grandparents and as I got older and started studying the history of Black Chicago, I realized that this was really a, a culmination of a, of, a, of a very long history that has existed in the city. But that, I think mean, at that moment was my, my first exposure to Black activism and really at the tail end of it. And as I got older and started teaching about it, talking about Lou Palmer and, 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 and uh, Peggy Montez and all these other folks talking, to, you know, working to get Harold Washington elected, I, I just realized that as, as, a, as a kid, 
this was like my first moment understanding what black activism was here in Chicago. Great, thanks, uh, thanks for that for that reflection. Um, uh, so we're going to do a lot of talking about, uh, particularly in, in our first segment here, uh, about the past and uh, looking back at black activism. Uh, let's start uh, with the, the 1950s and 1960s, which I think generally regarded as the the height of the the civil rights movement uh, of that particular day. Anyhow. Uh, think about some of the anti-segregation protests that got national attention, uh, like the Montgomery bus boycott. Uh, Dr. Kimball, uh, can you give us a refresher about uh, the goal of, of, that, uh, of that boycott? Well, the bus boycott was really this, com- this, this intersection of, of uh, the Black uh, labor movement, the Black labor movement, and really the, the, the burgeoning civil rights movement in the 1950s, I think. Um, I think, by and large, we think of this as really kicking off of the movement. The bus boycott, along with the murder of Emmett Till, the lynching of Emmett Till, really, and, and the Brown v. Board of Education decision, which really were, were these, the catalyst for the movement we see in the 50s and 60s and, and to some degree the, the 1970s. But one of the things that uh, we see there was Black people in Montgomery, Alabama, launched a year-long protest of the bus, the bus service, the protest, you know, segregation of public accommodations, which was really one of the things they've been fighting for um, in the early, very early stages of the civil rights movement. Uh, this lawyer named Charles Hamilton Houston was really the one who started, uh, who was really pushing to desegregate, you know, these public spaces. He was like one of the these mod, the lawyers in the modern time who was pushing for this. So we, we find that Black folk in Montgomery, Alabama, protesting, uh, refusing to ride the bus, really hitting the Montgomery uh, city government where, where it hurt the most in the pocketbook. Uh, this will be people like Edie Nixon show up. Edie Nixon was a Pullman porter, and we talk about the history of the Pullman porters and how important they were to Black Chicago. Uh, and this was really the ascension of uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This was really his his first foray into the the national uh, spotlight coming out of out, out of Montgomery. Great, and and uh, you know, the the they were the the target was a specific policy in terms of uh, African Americans having to ride. Uh, on, the, on, the on the back, back of the bus, the bus. right? That's, so that's, that's really the, the big thing about it, you know, and, and you know, during this, this period, Black folks were playing, had to pay the same amount of money to ride the bus, but were regulated to the back of the bus. And the, the, the painful irony of this is even if um, white people who, were, who rode in the front of the bus needed a seat, Black people in the back of the bus had to vacate their seats to, to, to give it to, to white people. And, we, and of course, we know this is where you know, this is the story of, of Rosa, where Rosa Parks comes into, the, into the, the national national scene as a secretary of the local NAACP. And she was the one that, you know, took it upon herself, you know, to, to launch this, this boycott, um, even though the NAACP was, was was planning to do something about buses. Mm-hmm. But she I think she figured, you know, now is as good a time as any uh, to, to do this. And, and, and the rest, as they say, is history. Sure, sure. Now, now, now Clarence, the, the bus boycott was a, a very you know, kind of uh, you know, deliberate and strategic action, uh, and it eventually captured some media attention. Uh, you know, Dr. Kimball talked about how this kind of thrust uh, King into the, the national spotlight. Uh, will you talk a little bit about how organizers during that day were using the media uh, as a tool uh, in, 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 in their fight for, for, for civil rights? I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, I got to write a book about uh, the interplay between the media and the civil rights movement and black liberation. Uh, what's interesting to me is how much happened, and I, I was very much alive at that time. I, I was uh, uh, growing up uh, at the time in, uh, well, 1957. I, I remember a, a, a pivotal moment. Uh, I, I didn't uh, know that much about Emmett Till because I was only about six years old when, when uh, that tragedy occurred. And I just remember my relatives talking about it. And whenever I'd come in the room, they would hush up because they they didn't want to talk about that that awful lynching uh, in front of the kids. But uh, I remember the Little Rock, uh, uh, the desegregation of Central High School in Little Rock uh, was uh, what, seven uh, young black teenagers had the courage uh, to uh, walk in and uh, desegregate uh, that high school. And and, uh, one thing that they had that that, uh, Emma Till didn't have was TV cameras. Uh, It's just something, we have to, have to remember TV wasn't was coming into its own, but not TV news. We didn't have mini cams then, that sort of thing. Uh, 
Uh, and so uh, the boycott, uh, the bus boycott uh, was covered with a lot of images. You saw buses on, on the TV, but you didn't see that, that much about what was ha actually happening on the bus. Uh, whereas the Little Rock Nine, when they marched into that high school, uh, you had national TV, uh, national media there. And when, uh, when, when this one white girl spit on this black girl's dress, uh, and, and, and when there was some other ruckus broke out, uh, the whole nation saw it and was appalled. And, and that helped really move things along. I think that's a big reason why between 1965, well, I mean, most of the, the civil rights era we talk about occurred between uh, what, 1954, the Brown v. Board decision, uh, Emmett Till was what, 55? 55. Uh, then the, the, the bus boycott, like 56. Uh, you talk about that then all the way up to uh, the Civil Rights uh, uh, Bill of 64, uh, also, uh, uh, I just missed Little Rock, but uh, you had the Greenville sit-ins, uh, you had the Freedom Brides, you had uh, the uh, voter registration drives, the death of Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney, all occurred like in the early 60s, between 60 and 60, 65. And, and then you had the what, Civil Rights Act of 64, Voting Rights Act of 65, Fair Housing Act of 67, which... We can talk about that because Chicago community organizations had a lot to do with that housing act getting passed. Uh, and, but a lot of, of it was because TV was around. TV put all this on national, uh, in, in national living rooms. And that really helped to move things along uh, in a way that you saw more positive changes for black folks in those few years, uh, but it still wasn't done and we're still fighting it today. Yeah, you've, you've, touched, you've actually kind of touched on the next question, but I, I wanted to stick with this point about the importance of television uh, particularly some of the images that people saw. So you talked about the, um, the, the white girl spitting on, on one of the uh, Little Rock Nine as they were trying to in, enter Central High School. And there are a number of very iconic video images and, and still images of the violent uh, assaults that uh, many folks uh, were encountering when they were peacefully protesting, uh, you know, being dragged away from lunch counters, I think about uh, the uh, the uh, Bloody Sunday on the uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge uh, with right. uh, uh, with everything that uh, happened there. John Lewis uh, uh, and hundreds of protesters, uh, 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 police attack dogs, and all of that. Um, what was the the impact of people seeing that kind of violent assault, particularly in response to people who were protesting in a nonviolent fashion? It was remarkable because. Everybody knew about, especially black folks, we all knew how segregated we were. I, mean, I was four years old when I uh, heard the, the rules that, that I couldn't go to the local amusement park I wanted to go to uh, because uh, little colored kids couldn't go there, quote unquote. Uh, Martin Luther King in a letter from Birmingham jail talks about telling his daughter that she couldn't go to kitty land because colored kids couldn't go over there. I mean, black folks were very well aware from an early age of our status in the American apartheid system. Uh, it was white folks didn't know. I, I went to school. Uh, on Monday morning, I remember uh, during, uh, during the fall, uh, fall and uh, uh, one of my white friends, uh, uh, and I guess, I guess I was about six or, six or seven, uh, seven years old, uh, one of my white friends uh, said he had just been to the Swordsville Lake, it's a whole amusement park, and boy, a really great place, uh, had you been there? And I said, well, my parents told me little colored kids couldn't go to the Swordsville Lake. He said, what? Oh, no, that can't be true. And I said, oh, really? Have you seen colored kids over there? And then he thought for a minute, realized he hadn't. The white folks don't notice when we're not there. And, and, and that was what really, to me, kept the civil rights movement from moving faster, uh, uh, prevented a lot of progress from happening because our oppression was not visible. TV brought visibility to it. And we still find that today. And now people get very upset with us. They, they call it critical race theory and everything else. If you bring up what is just American history, uh, but, uh, TV cut through it, and I, I think today's uh, video media are doing the same thing. That was really one of, the, one of the strategies of King, right? In, in SCLC in particular, right? They wanted to expose, right? King would say something like he wanted to expose Southern racism and bring it into in people's homes, right? And I think right. what, what we what we see with the, in the post-George Floyd world, the, the world changes when these things are put on television. Uh, Dr. Kimball, stay with you for a second. Uh, despite the fact that these were nonviolent protests, these were still considered radical actions in some, in some ways, mm -hmm. weren't they? 
Yeah, I think I think the irony is, and and uh, Clarence talked. If I may, Clarence talked about the letter from Birmingham jail and how you know when when King went to Birmingham, um, some of the the local ministers called him a radical, right? They called him an extremist. And I think one of the, I think when I teach the letter from Birmingham, John, I, th- I think it's one of the the best piece of pieces of writing of the 20th century, if not American history and American history. And, I agree. And, and, and some of just the rhetorical strategies that King uses, he he, he alludes to the fact that people call Jesus an extremist and a radical, right? But you know, in, in hindsight, no one people, white folks in particular, didn't criticize the, the work of Jesus. Um, and I, I think it's it's quite common when we find people doing good work, their enemies call them radicals. Um, I think one of the the base tenets of America is like Americans, by and large, hate change. Right, which is which is interesting coming from a historian who you know what but one of the things we talk about continuity in our field is continuity and change in the historical profession but um I, I, yeah i think i think that's the, the irony of of king and you know i was i was talking earlier um just to, to one of your colleagues of just about how people we, re, we remember uh reverend king and how you know uh politicians on both the left and the right always evoke his his image in his in his in his in his words um, to fit their own political programs. And uh, I, I think the, one of the ironies is that when King was alive, remember King was alive, you know, conservatives and racists uh, didn't want to see him alive. They wanted they wanted him dead. And now we, we hold them up, even, you know, those on an extreme right hold King up as, as like this, this, this mantle of what America could be when 70 years ago, no one was saying that no one was, was you know, holding him up, up like that, so. May I add something to that? Oh, sure. Go ahead, please. I, I can't. I can't hold back. But I. <laughs> no, I think I, you're absolutely right. And what gets me about it is, first of all, letter from Birmingham Jail was written uh, not to uh, the white bigots and conservatives, but to the white ministers of Birmingham, to the, the the ministerial establishment, who were on the side of the civil rights movement, but they thought King was moving too fast. The movement was, was, was asking for too much too quickly. And th- this led Dr. King to preach, how long, how long must we wait? You know, and this is still something we see today. And, and you still see it with the, also, uh, it's, you're absolutely right. It is uh, re- remarkably ironic uh, that so many uh, white people uh, who uh, thought King was a commie radical before are now quoting uh, him uh, widely. But what, what are they quoting? That one line about, uh, judging a man by the color, uh, by the content of his character, not by the color of his skin. Yeah. They everybody quotes that. That's from the from the uh, uh, '64 Civil Rights March. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, "I Have a Dream" speech, sure. uh, a, a beautifully written speech too. But what you don't see quoted, and I always point this out to people, I say that's a wonderful line. Uh, but you know, read a little farther in there, and Dr. King talks about the promissory note. The promissory yeah. note was what the, what the founders of this country wrote to black folks. A yeah. promise of, of payback, reparations, in other words. And King argues forcefully for reparations for that, that uh, uh, promissory note that came back marked insufficient funds. And we are still making the same argument today. And when I point this out to, to, to uh, my uh, white conservative friends, uh, then they start calling me a radical. But that's the way things happen. <laughs> um, now, uh, while well, King was labeled a radical, uh, Dr. Kimball, uh, this nonviolent resistance was it was 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 certainly a, a very prominent philosophy, but it, it wasn't the only ways in which black activism was being ro- rolled out. If you could talk a little bit more about some of the different approaches, some that were were even considered even more radical than what what King was doing. Well, I, I think the the juxtaposition of of of, of Minister Malcolm X is probably jumps into my mind first, but I think that um, well, this, this is a really long history, but I, I think. To, to keep it within this time frame, what you're talking about, I think the 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 practices of the, of the Nation of Islam and Minister Malcolm, in the way they talked about being more confrontational towards racism, I think was 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 a really interesting uh, conversation to have during that time. And I think quite interestingly is is the regions in which these two men were operating dictated how they talked, at least publicly. And, and I think we can get to a, a longer conversation about how King became so much more radical when we talked about when he linked the civil rights movement with the, the anti-war movement, which is a con- 
completely different story, right? Which you talk about the radical radicalization and radicalization of, of King's rhetoric. But you know, I think that outside of of uh, Minister Malcolm, I think keeping it more of a local story, I, I think um, uh, Fred Hampton Senior comes to mind, and really what he was trying to do. Um, the black and within operating within the Black Panther Party here in Illinois and in Chicago, in, in, in particular, about this more confronting racism by using, interestingly enough, the the law, right? Because one of the things that I think we, we we forget about the large story about the Black Panthers that they were using existing laws for self and making arguments for self defense. If the state doesn't protect their rights, then they were going to do it themselves. But also, I think that you know, uh, uh, Fred Hampton's message of coalition building, I think was very much important, right? If we think about the early Rainbow Coalition where he brought together, you know, African-Americans, Puerto Ricans and whites to form this, this progressive uh, civil rights, human rights movement, anti-capitalism movement here in Chicago, which was something which wasn't that unusual given the, the, the history of black activism here in Chicago, right? I think black folks have always been, I started with this, been very politically astute, but also in their own political movements have always worked with other groups outside of our communities to try to push forth their own agenda. So I, I think looking, moving past Malcolm, I think looking at what Fred Hampton was doing is, a, is really another, another, another example, more radical anti-capitalism, anti-racism agenda, which I think ironically enough is coming back up now with this younger generation of activists, but we, I don't want to get too far ever in our conversation. No, no, that that that's 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 great though. Insights um, with regard to uh, to uh, to uh, to Chairman Fred Hampton. Thanks for 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 raising that. Um, we have a question from the audience, which is going to help us move along a little bit and and kind of get us talking a little bit uh, about the the era that came uh, after you know kind of this uh, era of the civil rights movement. This uh, question comes from uh, from Donna, and actually before I mention the question, if you have questions for the guests. Please drop those in the chat and we'll get to, we'll try to get to as many of them as we can during the course of our conversation. So back to Donna's question, um, which is uh, why did black activism take a huge pause after the sixties? And Clarence, uh, we can toss this your way. Is pause a right way to think about those two kind of time periods, the sixties and then uh, maybe the seventies and the eighties after that? Would, would you call that a pause or how would you describe the, the transition. No, if I was looking for a punchline, I, I would answer that, that question by saying disco. Uh, but no, uh, we did not dance our way through the 70s. Actually, a lot was going on on the streets. Uh, uh, it might not have gotten uh, the kind of publicity that, that the Black Panthers or, or uh, Dr. King's movement, uh, various others, uh, I, I could mention the CCO on the South Side, the, yeah. the, uh, to desegregate the schools in Chicago, the, the Willis wagons that were the model the school classrooms that, that, that helped keep the schools segregated. But uh, uh, that, that kind of set up the 70s because uh, uh, what, I mean, for me, as a reporter, my big beat was neighborhood organizations and, and housing issues, uh, particularly uh, mortgage, uh, 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 well, it was, it was the exploitation of mortgages and FHA uh, uh, mortgage insurance uh, was used to really, going to long story, uh, fleece hundreds of home, black homeowners just in Chicago alone. Uh, and it's uh, today you hear about it with the, uh, um, with, um, the um, uh, more recent uh, uh, bank scandal of, of a few years ago, but that really started back in the 70s and organizations around town. Uh, the Contract Buyers League was an important organization uh, for, uh, for black home ownership. Uh, black folks couldn't uh, get a mortgage, so they had to buy houses on contract like, like, like my mom and dad did. Uh, and uh, if the person you were buying from, uh, if, if you missed a payment, they wanted to foreclose on you, they would just do it and keep the money. Uh, that sort of exploitation, Contract Buyers League was, was one of the leading um, neighborhood organizations at that time uh, that turned out to have, a, a, they built up to a, a lot of political clout, a lot of reforms. Uh, and there was, a, I mentioned CCO a minute ago, there was the, the uh, Coalition of Community Council organizations. I, I'm, I'm going to screw this up, but they helped organize uh, the bringing of Dr. King to Chicago. Uh, as well as a number of uh, other uh, reforms in the law uh, around town. Uh, and, and the um, uh, 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 political campaigns that were going on 
uh, during the 70s, uh, uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, campaign, but there's a lot of organizing uh, out in, in the community uh, that led to Harold Washington's campaign uh, in uh, the early 80s. Uh, and uh, uh, Congressman Ralph Medcalf, uh, a friend of his was beat up uh, by the police. And he, who had been part of Mayor Richard J. Daley or Richard I, part of his machine, uh, uh, turned against Mayor Daley and became one of the leaders in the new black political uh, organizing that led to Harold Washington's campaign. Now, a lot of things were happening in the 70s, but, but uh, it, it, it kind of got overshadowed by disco. Uh, disco, huh? I, I was a kid and remember, uh, remember, uh, remember a lot about the, you know, the music, the the dress, all all of that. Um, you can't, for, you can't forget the big afros, the bell bottoms, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. and those Nick Nick shirts, you know, which Richard Pryor went up in flames because of that uh, shirt. That's another story. Yeah. Uh, uh, we 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 talked earlier about some of the big victories that happened uh, in the '60s, and I, I you know say uh, victories in terms of the the change in, in or the, the uh, installment of legislation, you know, uh, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, uh, the Fair Housing Act, you know, all were in, in, in large part due uh, to uh, black activism. And, and Kermit, you even referenced uh, Chicago Roots being a, a big part of the Fair Housing Act when, um, with those things in place, um, uh, Dr. Kimball, where were activists turning their attention in terms of things that they were targeting? Uh, in the in the seventies and eighties, were were there new targets now that folks were going after? Well, I, I think jobs, jobs and education. I think were, were two of the big ones. Um, you know, I, I think these political movements and these political programs that get that bring it, yeah, bring in affirmative action programs that open these doors for, you know, um, college students and people to move into different fields, right? So when we what we have is, generally speaking. You know the, these pioneers moving into corporate America and trying to open these doors and, and move up the corporate ladder, um, it, but also to increase their 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 you know their communities moving out of you know these these segregated black communities and moving into you know into areas of more conspicuous consumption. I think even thinking about you know into, into the late seventies early eighties, you know we start seeing the rise of the Buffy culture, right, in which you know black folks are trying to enjoy some of the accoutrements of, of what it means to be, be an American. I think part of this larger story that we're telling is, is, you know, black folks have always made these arguments about where we fit into the larger narrative of America. And I think by the sixties and late sixties, seventies and, and early 1980s, we started seeing that uh, some of these dreams of having arrived um, are coming to fruition. Um, but I don't think, I think Clarence talked about, you know, some things that were going on to the 1970s. Um, it, it was very challenging. You know, school segregation was still a hot topic. You know, there were still difficulties in achieving neighborhood parity. Um, but so I think some of the, the biggest successes is that we see these political movements in Gary, see the political movements in this groundswell in, in, in Chicago with Harold Washington, in, in Detroit with Coleman Young, in Atlanta, we, so we, we see black people are entering into the political arena, but you know um, there were some successes, but there was still they they realized there was still a long way to go during this period, and I, and I, I want, think to go back to, to go back to Donna's question a little bit, I, I think one of the one of the polemics of, of that question I think is um, it's easy to think about activism going away or going underground because the cameras weren't there to cover it, and it's like if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there around to hear it, does it make a sound? And it's really the same thing. And I think Clarence have talked about, you know, um, and then we talked about earlier, Lou and Georgia Palmer, who were very active in the 1970s you know, and, and early 80s to get Harold Washington to run for mayor, right? We see these things go underground, but they, by no, no stretch of imagination, go away or take a pause. We just don't, they just out of, sometimes appear out of the cover of, of light. Sure, sure. Uh, some might argue that uh, because of those, 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 those victories, if you will, in the 60s and some of the lack of media attention, uh, you, you, you talked, uh, Dr. Kimball, about uh, kind of the rise of, to some degree anyway, of, of, of uh, the culture of, uh, among Black folks that, you know, we have arrived, so on and so forth. In some respects, the, 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 at least some parts of the Black community take their 
put off the gas? Would, 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 is that an accurate way of describing that, or, or would, would you would you disagree with that? I think one one of the problems that we that we've always had, like I, I most of my work revolves around uh, the New Deal, uh, New Deal liberalism, 1930s, 40s, 50s in Chicago, and and one of the things that I, that argued is that um, when those folks who were able to escape the confines of the segregated black community, so-called ghetto, right? They, they were able to escape those. Well, the people who were left or the people who, who generally uh, we didn't talk about anymore because, you know, um, they were the people who, who didn't have the necessary resources to move out. So the, the success story are those folks who were able to move out of Bronzeville and into Chatham or into so other places. Um, so I'm not sure if, it, if they're taking it, their foot off the gas. I, I think that people's priorities change. It's, it's easier, in my opinion, to launch a revolution or a movement when we're all in the same boat together, right? But when life gets more complicated, the more success you have, the more money you make, the more, the more drama comes into your life, the tendency is to say, okay, I have to to get mine, which is part of the, the American ethos, right? This idea of rugged individualism. And I think black people bought into that as well. But, you know, coming from a history in which by and large, we we, we move, we, we rose and fell together, buying into a, America, we kind of lost some of that to some degree. But I, I think when we do have these people who did make it, and I'm thinking about, oh, what's the guy's name? The, the, ad, the big advertising executive who was doing um, in Chicago, his name escapes me at, the, at this point, but he was, you know, one of the things he, he did soft sheen and he did the first black McDonald's advertisement with, with black people in. So there were even these people who, who had escaped and had moved to the purple ladder, but they were still trying to pull people up, pull other black folks and the images of black folks into a more positive light. But um, I don't know about taking the foot off the gas, but I think there's a priorities change. Yeah, I think there was, there was a lot of, um, well, uh, the community uh, splintered in a lot of ways, not that we turned against each other, but that when opportunities opened up, people took them. Mm-hmm. And so uh, our community wasn't as concentrated as it has had, uh, has been. I uh, uh, overlooked something a little earlier when I said Emmett Till wasn't covered by the media. Uh, in, in fact, Emmett Till was covered by Jet Magazine. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And uh, ask any of your grandparents or whatever who, uh, who can recall this. Uh, uh, Emmett Till's mother insisted on an open casket. He was beaten beyond recognition. Uh, mm-hmm. But there he really was in, 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 in his sweet, pristine Sunday suit, but his face was gone. And I mean, it, it was incredible. But people lined up to come and view the casket down the street. They were lined up for two, three days they're, they're at, uh, at Rainer's funeral home on the south side. And uh, because Jet Magazine, uh, printed a picture uh, of it and, and covered the funeral. That put Emmett Hill in the national headlines. Uh, word spread quickly, and and this in the seventies we began to see more black media pop up. You mentioned black advertising, uh, also a uh, uh, black TV, uh, and cable didn't come along until the eighties. But even you know, in the seventies we had Channel Twenty Six. Uh, there were Soul Train began, <laughs> and uh, there in Chicago. Uh, we had uh, a number of resources at a lot of different places uh, that uh, meant there were more choices for people to have now, and there were uh, the community was spreading out. It used to be it was all around 47th Street or 63rd Street. Now, you know, it, it was beginning to spread out farther. And look at the latest census report. What do you see? Uh, white folks in the city, their population is going up. Hispanic population is going up. Black folks, our population is going down because uh, ever since the mid 80s, we've been moving out to the suburbs or someplace else. And, and so that has caused the community not to be as concentrated as it used to be. But the very fact that, that we, we've got a, a big signs pointing where Bronzeville is now, that wasn't around when I came to Chicago in the late 60s. You had, you had to, to go to books like Black Metropolis to learn about Bronzeville. Now we celebrate Bronzeville and so many other black historical sites. So I, I see a reversal now where the community is coming together in new and productive ways. Okay. I think what's um, interesting with that one is that, you know, I, I think when I was a kid, they used even, they even called it really Bronzeville. They used to call it the low end, right? Going to the low end. And no one wanted to go to the low end. And now right. Bronzeville is, you know, this renewed interest in, in, the, in the community. It's uh, cheap. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to jump ahead a little bit uh, from, you know, we, we, we started in the, 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 the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s and talked some about what was going on in the 70s and 80s. We're going to kind of bring it forward to 
to today. And of, of course, we all remember uh, last summer, uh, you know, when the country erupted uh, after George Floyd was killed by a white police officer. Uh, what would you say about um, the strategies that we've talked about? You know, uh, how have they been uh, ad adapted in some way uh, to, uh, to the challenges that we're facing today? Uh, we've seen marches that resemble um, uh, what we remember from the civil rights era, but, but our marches being used in the same way today. Like last summer, were, were those the same kinds of marches that we saw back in the 60s? May I jump in on that? I, uh, as I mentioned, I've been covering these organizations in Chicago since the, the, the 60s with Jesse Jackson and Fred Hampton, uh, Mark Clark, Bobby Rush. Uh, uh, and uh, one thing that, that the organizations had then, especially a high profile like the Panthers, for example, uh, they had an agenda. Uh, you know what they stood for. They had a to-do list of things that had to be uh, that needed to be done uh, in and for the black community. Uh, today, you have organizations where it's all in the title, like Black Lives Matter. Uh, the agenda is simply that, make Black Lives Matter, because you know, they do. And so uh, it's particularly focused on, on a police uh, 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 conduct issues. Uh, but there are other organizations, the, the, the Me Too movement, uh, there's various organizations now that uh, don't have a, an agenda in the old fashioned way. And I have criticized that in my column, because if you don't have an agenda uh, that people uh, know about, then they will make up one for you. And that's what happened to Black Lives Matter. Uh, people call it, well, all lives matter. It was a complete distortion, uh, but uh, that's all, only beginning the uh, same thing with critical race theory. Now that's become a new buzzword. Uh, they turned that academic uh, program into a slam against uh, black folks. And against Black history, I don't know what's going to happen in February, because all of a sudden there's some kind of a sin against the state to teach Black history. But that's kind of what's, what's happening now. So I, I see that as a difference. But I'm an old man. Who listens to me? I, I think um, that okay, Dr. Kimber. part of the similarities, though, is really the use of the media. I think that, you know, I, I completely agree with you about the, you know, how Black Lives Matter has been co-opted and bastardized and saying that we could have raised theory. But I think that this group of young activists um, realize and are, are much more politically, excuse me, um, socially, social media savvy than, you know, than, than, than their, you know, previous generations. They, they understand what image and how, how these images work. They understand how to get the communications out. They understand how to organize very quickly. You know, thinking about, again, my work, you know, the, the CP, the Communist Party was really one of the major organizing forces during the Depression. And the, the way the, that these, these kids, these young people organized via Twitter and Instagram and other social media platforms uh, to, to bring this attention to bear on these acts of racism is, is really important. I think it's very, very great stuff coming out of this, this modern movement. Uh, I'm going to uh, get one last uh, question here from uh, from a member of the audience uh, to kind of round out our segment. Uh, so if, if uh, you can chime in quickly on this question, it comes from Stephanie. Uh, and she asks, how is it that the 1965 Civil Rights Bill does not, in fact, end legal discrimination and provide equality for all human beings? Why is the fight forever ongoing? Oh, there are no easy answers in life, are there? <laughs> That's what, what it's about. Yeah, the, uh, well, it, it is a tribute to the Civil Rights and the Voting Rights Act, for example. It is a tribute to the Voting Rights Act that the Supreme Court keeps having to revisit it. Why? Because it is so effective that people who don't want Black folks to vote will keep on finding ways to, to, to fight it out. Now, you see this happening around the country now with these uh, uh, voter ID laws and various other ways to try to suppress the Black vote. Just like the pick up your history books and go back, uh, and uh, the professor knows what I'm talking about, go back to Reconstruction time. And what happened after we got the right to vote in the, in the uh, uh, 15th Amendment, uh, we uh, suddenly had, had to fight to keep the right to vote. And, and, and you saw uh, that was all rolled back in, in the South uh, through the Reconstruction period, post-Reconstruction and uh, uh, the, the, the Black Codes. And it wasn't until I was in high school, like I said, 64, 60, uh, 65, the Civil Rights Acts were passed. I didn't realize that at the time that I was witnessing history. I was witnessing the other end of the Civil War that I'd seen in Gone with the Wind. Uh, but that's how 
deeply entrenched racism is institutionally in this country. I love this country. I, I served it in the military. I love its potential, but you've got to constantly fight uh, for your rights and the fight to keep your rights. I think that's a great point to close out. I, I do want to make a, one acknowledgement from uh, another member of the audience. Uh, Janice uh, shared that yesterday's Fresh Air included a discussion of racial inequality in higher education. Thanks, Janice. We'll drop a link to that conversation in the comments for the rest of our audience. Gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, I've been speaking with Clarence Page, columnist for the Chicago Tribune, and Dr. Lionel Kimball, Professor of History at Chicago State University. Gentlemen, thanks again for being with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before my next guest join me, uh, I have a question for you watching at home. What are your hopes for the future of Black activism? Where do you want to see the movement go? Please tell us in the comments. Um, and now let's turn to Black activists working in Chicago today. Just over one year ago, my colleague at Vocalo, Jill Hopkins, hosted a multi-generational panel of local activists. I'm glad to welcome two of them back today. First, I'd like to introduce you to Brenda Sharif. She's the first vice president of the NAACP Southside Chicago chapter. Her roots in activism stretch back to the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Congress of Racial Equality and the Black Panthers, three very tremendous pillars of black activism uh, during the period we were just discussing uh, in our first segment. Uh, uh, Brendan, it sounds like you could have been uh, very much a part of the panel uh, that we just had. Um, I, was, so I was chomping. I was chomping at the bit. I lived this. <laughs> these folks, these folks read about it, studied about it. I lived it. And uh, I thought that that was a very enthralling conversation. I thought that both gentlemen did a wonderful job in painting a picture for those people that want a retrospective view. And I... Uh, must say that many of the things, particularly those things that Clarence said about what has happened, what has stalled the movement, and that's what we called it, the movement, what has stalled that is that back in the day, the agendas were set by the older, uh, more um, seasoned, <laughs> members of our community. And it was those of us that were the young Turks, as they used to say, full of piss and vinegar, that were ready to go out there and did not believe that what had been set before us as agendas could not be accomplished. And that is the main difference now. I am seeing such ageism that there is a pushback from those of us that have been out there for years, we know what works. I think they, they credit um, Thomas Edison when he had failed at making allegedly, it was actually Lattimore that did it, but that's not, it's neither here nor there, um, that he had failed so many times. He said, now I know 10,000 things that don't work. And that's what, living will do for you. I am most concerned about the stall in bringing justice to Laquan McDonald. And one of the things that the NAACP has, has wanted to do uh, was to get the U.S. Attorney, John Lausch, or Joe Lausch, excuse me, not John, Joe Lausch, to reconvene the grand jury that had been in place with the US Department of Justice to bring this, bring civil charges against uh, Van Dyke. And that has not happened. And we have not been able to get the, the energy of the youth to say justice still needs to be served. Many people feel that with the uh, criminal action and the conviction that it's a done deal. Absolutely not. Absolutely. Well, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to just jump in just for a moment. Okay. Uh, thanks for, 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 for being with us today. And, and we're going to, we're going to get to some of that in just a minute. I want to get our, our other guest in uh, here. Uh, Jamie Frazier uh, uh, is the executive director of the Lighthouse Foundation, an organization that advocates for the black LGBTQ community across Chicagoland. He's also 
pastor of Lighthouse Church Chicago. Jamie, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. I'm uh, very honored to be a part of this conversation, Alden. Great, great. So uh, we want to make sure we, we get uh, sufficient time with, with both of you uh, tackling uh, some issues and, and a question or two from the audience. Uh, I should let you know that we expect to be joined by another activist representing the younger generation, but she's uh, been kept away with an illness. We wish her a quick recovery. Uh, for those of you who are in your teens and 20s, I'll count on you to offer your perspective. Uh, so please do so in our comments and we'll share uh, some of those uh, as we talk to our guests. Um, so um, uh, going to uh, kind of jump right into the meat of our, our conversation, um, an audience member actually has graciously asked the perfect question to kind of help catch us up uh, with each of you. Uh, Janelle asked, uh, what current campaign uh, do you wish people knew more about? So uh, quickly, Bryn um, and, uh, and Jamie, if you can tell us uh, what, what you're working on. Okay, as I'd, I said. Okay, go ahead, Jamie. I'd like to highlight the Black Queer Equity Index. So Lighthouse Foundation advances justice for Black queer people across Chicagoland through empowerment, education, and entertainment. We're a two-year-old organization and we are pursuing racial equity through a data-driven approach. So we are surveying five LGBT organizations to discern the extent to which their executive boards and also their C-suites and staff mirror the communities and populations where they serve. So we're surveying AIDS Foundation Chicago, sent on Halstead, Chicago House, Howard Brown Health, and also Equality Illinois. And the principal proposition of Lighthouse Foundation is that when Black queer people are well, all Black people are well. But what we are learning is that justice doesn't trickle down, but it does trickle up. What works for Black trans folk and for Black queer men will also work for heterosexual elders and heterosexual Black women. Too often when we talk about Black justice and Black equity, Black queer folk are erased from history, as some have attempted to do to Bayard Rustin, who helped organize the March on Washington. So I'm excited about engaging in this conversation and connecting some poll stars to hopefully form some constellations. Great, thanks so much for that, Jamie. Uh, Brandon, you wanna tell us what you're working on? Brenda, you, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I think something stalled. I think Jamie oh. froze or froze. I didn't hear. What what was the question? Oh, just uh, if you can briefly tell us what uh, what what what's a campaign that you're working on right now? I know I know you're doing some we, work. We have animals. several. We have several. One is environmental justice, which is extremely important. Uh, African Americans tend to have a much, much shorter life. The actuarial tables prove that out. And it's uh, largely in part to our environment and diet. So we work in, on both of those ends, both the environment and healthy eating concepts for uh, African-Americans to uh, have diets that uh, help us dodge the bu bullet for so many diseases, chronic diseases that plague uh, people in our community. The other thing, as I had indicated, we are, uh, we have constantly written letters to the U.S. Attorney General here in the Northern District to ask him to reconvene. He is the intermediary. Mm -hmm. uh, the new president has not yet appointed a person. We are, um, uh, endorsing uh, a candidate who I won't say right now, she hasn't given me permission to do that, uh, so that we can bring justice to Laquan McDonald. We also have been very, very active in the police reform. Uh, our president, uh, Attorney Rose Joshua, has sat on uh, several committees as this framework for police um, citizen participation has been going on over the last few years. And with the Board of Education, the um, creation of a more equitable community involvement in the curriculum. And this is one of the things that Harold Washington, we always tout Harold Washington as being a person that we truly love. Uh, he established the citizen uh, 
the local school councils for citizens to determine what the curriculum and the budget would be in their individual schools. And we just have not had the full participation because I think it's lack of understanding by the community how powerful that is. And now they're going to have an elected board of education. I don't think it's gonna really be any better. I think it should stay local, but that's- um, So you've, you've got a, a lot of things going on, Brent. Thank, yes. Thanks for sharing that. Um, we've got a lot of questions too from, from our audience members. So I wanna to try to, to get, get as many of those in as I can. Jamie, let's turn back to you for a quick second. Mark asked, how has the role of the church changed over time in terms of black activism? We heard a lot about that uh, earlier on. If you can talk about faith in in, in today's uh, in today's movement, yeah. Well, first, an historical piece. Often, when we talk about the 50s, 60s, 70s, and black activism, we talk about the black church. And while it is true that many black churches rose to the occasion, it's also true that many black churches did not. I mean, the whole reason we got the progressive Baptist denomination is because the National Baptist Convention wasn't willing to accept and support Dr. King. In terms of what we are experiencing now, Black activism is rising out of soil outside of the Black church. You know, when I look at the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi, we're talking about Black queer women. And in too many cases, the Black church has disremembered has ignored, has sought to erase, silence, objectify Black women as well as Black queer people. So it does not surprise me that liberation is springing from soil in other locations. We find now that activism is springing up out of the classroom. It is springing up out of community-based organizations. It is springing up out of social media and online communities and networks. Black activism is alive and well and it is existing outside of the church because sadly the black church has not followed liberation to its natural end, which is the human flourishing of all people, people of all gender identities and sexual orientations. And until the church does right by black women and black queer folk, it will be increasingly irrelevant. And I say that as a black church pastor. All right, thank you so much for that. Very, 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 very detailed answer there. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Uh, another question we have, this one comes from Frank. Uh, he talks about current activists linking up with more mature community leaders. And, 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 and Bren, you spoke to this a little bit earlier on. What is there with regard to intergenerational collaboration within Black activism today? Is, is there a lot of work that needs to be done or, or do, you, do you see some collaboration happening between uh, the, the, the old and, and, and the young? Mm -hmm. I, I, it is, I want to believe that the spirit is there. However, the technology may not be. And for those people that are in my generation, which uh, I'm a child of the forties, that many of us lack behind in the ability to interact or even have the desire to interact at that we are more tactical. We, you know, we like the touchy feely and not this cyber uh, conceptual uh, modality that it appears that the newer, the, the younger uh, people have, have gotten involved in. And so that is, so I think they call it digital divide. <laughs> and that has created the dichotomy uh, between the generations, the generational dichotomy. I think we all want the same thing. We would like to have the same thing, uh, but it's a different approach. And we have not been able to come together and communicate, uh, focusing on our samenesses. And that to me is critical. We are always looking at differences and the media plays a huge part in uh, uh, making the divides. What are the differences? It's not the differences that we get progress, but it's when we come together on our sameness. And that is something that we really need to work on. 
uh, kind of in the spirit of what of what you're saying, uh, Bryn, uh, just sharing an audience comment. Uh, Erica says, "I'd, I'd like the uh, for the movement to represent a diverse group of Blacks in America, educated, less educated, affluent, middle class, working class, to come together on a unified agenda that enriches the lives of Black America uh, at large." Um, uh, here's another question uh, I'll throw to to each of you. Uh, Tony asks, uh, "I can't be on the front lines of protest. How can I best support?" the activists who are? Um, I, can, I can say that the NAACP is a membership organization. It is the oldest civil rights organization in the world. We are over 110 years old. I would put our constitution and our organizational structure, but with any organization or any organisms, you have to have moving parts, working parts. and after the um, civil rights uh, laws, legislation that went into place, many people thought we had arrived. And now with this post, uh, post uh, what do we call it? Post-racism that they say it doesn't exist anymore. It's, it's thicker now than it was when I was growing up in the South in the, in the 50s and uh, late 40s. It is, so different. And that is something that I think we need to come together on, bringing this diversity. We all want the same thing. I don't care if you're Black, white, Chinese, uh, wherever that you are. We basically want to manage our assets to make advances. And that is what I call a mama. And maybe we can have a mama movement, you know, <laughs> <laughs> managing our assets to make advances. Thanks, thanks so much, a mama movement, I like that. Thanks so much, Bryn. Um, uh, Jamie, how would, you, how would you respond to that question? How can people who can't be on the front line support the activists who are? The first thing that I would say is some of my grandmother's Southern homespun wisdom, an empty pitcher can't pour water. And, Continued survival as a Black person in America is an act of resistance and is a revolutionary act. So I, I don't know the ethnicity or the race of the person who asked that, but if it is a Black person, what I will say to you, brother, is continued survival is resistance. The second thing that I would say is practice self-care. Um, and then the third thing that I would say is look for organizations that you can make financial investments in look for virtual events where you can show up, educate yourself about important activities, important matters that are facing Black folk, that are facing your neighborhood, your community. There are lots of ways that we can show up virtually. There are lots of ways that we can donate. All of us don't have to be on the physical front lines. Great, great. Um, uh, we uh, want to make uh, one more um... I acknowledge one more uh, audience response. Uh, this comes from Tony. I would love to see all activism work towards a more respectful society, respectful of our differences and embracing those differences rather than dividing because of them. Um, and I'm gonna pose our last question as we are kind of getting really short on time. Uh, Brenda, I'm gonna start with you, uh, but this is a question for the same question is gonna be uh, for you as well, Jamie. Uh, Brenda, what do you want, uh, you know, what do you want or hope for for the future uh, of black, black uh, activism? Like what future do you hold for black activism? Uh, before you can act on something, they said the solution of the problem is often just identifying that there is a problem. And many people recognize problems, but they don't know the causation and certainly have not gotten any idea about the remedy. So as uh, Jamie has just indicated, there are organizations, read up on the organizations, see what they are about, not what you think, not what you have heard, but just test it out. And I would say that there are any number of organizations out here that have, uh, there's, so, there's something for everyone. There's somewhere that's gonna hit your passion, gonna hit, as they say, hit where you itch and just become involved. That is the key for me is involvement. And uh, the NAACP is a place that I'd invite people to come and re, as they say, re-examine the structure, re-examine the platform 
that has kept this organization alive for over a century. There's substance there. Yeah, I mean, if we look at our conversation, we started today talking about the Montgomery bus boycott and uh, Rosa Parks being the secretary for the NAACP. Uh, and, uh, and here we are talking about uh, the work uh, as you've expressed that the NAACP is still doing. Uh, Jamie, uh, the, that same question here and, and, and uh, you'll have a closing point. Uh, what do you hope for for black activism in the future? I hope for two things. I hope first for intersectional insight. I hope that black activists in the present and the future recognize how black liberation is connected to the plight of the undocumented and immigration, how black liberation is connected to the plight of pay equity for women, particularly black women, how the fight for black liberation is connected to the fight for queer liberation. Here's the thing. If you are not a white, thin, male, heterosexual, well-educated, cis man in America, you are othered, you are marginalized. Now imagine if we all got together and turned the system right side up. The second thing that I hope for is the principle of Sankofa. I hope that present and future activists look back to go forward. As a Black queer activist, I invite into this moment Jackie Anderson, a Black queer liberationist and fighter here in Chicago. I also speak the names of folk like Max, Max Smith and Pat McCombs, uh, Black folks who helped to liberate uh, Boys Town from some of its racism, but it can still continues to fester today. So as much as we strive to build new things, let us remember the shoulders of giants that we stand on like Brenda and others. That's a very fitting way to close out the conversation. Jamie, thank you so much for that. Uh, and I wanna to say to both of you, thanks so much for being with us, for your insights, uh, for sharing with us the work that thank you're you. engaging on now and thank how people you. can be involved. We were very blessed to have you with us today. Uh, unfortunately, we'll, we'll have to kind of leave it there. Uh, Jamie, you talked about going back, you know, looking backwards and, and going forward, and we tried to do a fair amount of that today, uh, looking at uh, kind of the generational legacy of Black activism. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone who has been watching, who's joined us today. Uh, we're dropping a link in the comments uh, to a survey. If you can spare a moment, uh, please let us know uh, what you'd like us to talk about next. Uh, and again, thanks again to, to Brenda Sharif and Jamie Frazier for joining me tonight, uh, and for you, our guests, for joining us. Good night.